Hey everyone, Harris here with iDownloadBlog. Today I'm talking with Dave Evans, a lecturer at Stanford University and the co-author of Design Your Life, a book that at Boston College uh, we read this summer. And Dave has had some extremely interesting jobs and careers over the years, including some time at Apple in the mid-80s, correct? Early Started in 1979, 79 to 82, 83. Right? Okay, so the late 90s, early 80s. Um, I just have some questions about how his time at Apple was and any stories that he has to share about um, his life while working with Apple. Yep. So you said that you were part of the original Lisa team. Yep. Well, the whole thing started, um, you have to understand, at the time, I fancied myself to be an advanced energy technologist. I had a master's in thermo sciences and mechanical engineering. I had negative interest in computing, not just no interest in computing. I disliked it. It was okay. boring. Um, I was trying to work in the energy field, uh, which was not going very well because the energy field actually didn't really exist. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I promised myself was if I had to give up on my, my dream of being an advanced energy technologist, which I eventually had to give up on, I was too soon, um, then I'll do something else, but I'm not going to do that computing, software stuff, whatever, which everybody else in Silicon Valley is doing. That's where I live in Silicon Valley. Because just because it's a big industry, you're not going to capitulate and do what everybody else does. Go do something like in medicine or do something else, but don't do the, the high tech thing. Mm -hmm. And I was um, working for a very small startup doing solar energy stuff that failed. And I had a welding torch in my hand. And I was welding together a test rig of a solar test rig uh, for a new product we were developing. And the phone rings. And somebody answered and go, hey, Dave, it's for you. you know, and I take the phone and it says, well, hi, my name is Barry. I'm from Apple Computer and we would like to talk with you. And I said, no, you don't want to talk to me. You want to talk to the other Dave Evans. See, Dave Evans is a really common name. Yeah. I'm the fourth in my family. My son is the fifth. His son is the sixth. I mean, there's, you know, when I signed up on AOL, like the week after AOL was invented, there are already 4,000 Dave Evanses. So, I've been running into the wrong Dave Evans all my life, and there's yeah. one at Hewlett Packard. So I said, oh, you want the one at Hewlett Packard. He's the high tech guy. I don't want to work for you. Click, and I hung up the phone. So I hung up on him. Then they call back and they go, no, no, we really want to talk to you. I go, no, you don't. And actually, you really have no reason to talk to me, and I don't want to talk to you. I hung up again. So I hung up on Apple four times. Um, this, by the way, I did not, this is not a good way to pursue opportunity. Um, they kept calling back. I mean, because at that point in time, probably still true today at Apple, you know, um, if anybody's going to hang up on you at Apple, it's Apple will hang up on you. Yeah. You don't get to hang up on us. You know, we're more arrogant than you. Trust me, nobody hangs up on us. So they kept saying, no, we really want to talk to you. And I said, this is stupid, but okay, fine. I will let you pay for my lunch. I'll come over and have lunch with you. And you will very quickly realize I'm the wrong guy. There's no reason for us to be in conversation. Um, and so I had that lunch. And they didn't realize I was the wrong guy, but then they go, you, we think you're kind of interesting. So 14 interviews later, over a three week period of time, including, you know, so I'm talking to Steve Jobs and, and, and they finally say, well, you know, you really don't understand anything about what we do here, but we think you might be an Apple kind of a guy. So let's give it a try. And that's how my Apple career got started. And then because I had a mechanical engineering degree, and almost everybody else had a computer science degree or a double E degree. You know, I was one of the very few mechanical engineers in the marketing, the product management group, which was yeah. all run by Steve Jobs. So, so Steve was not my direct boss, but he was my boss's boss. And I worked about 15 feet from him. We worked really closely. Um, and so they said, well, what can we have you do? Um, well, you, you're like an ME. You understand things that like have parts that move. Electronics don't move, they just get warm, you know, right. uh, but mechanical things move. So, well, the mouse moves, okay, so we, we, we haven't got one yet, we're gonna build a mouse, whatever a mouse is. So you're in charge of the mouse, you're in charge of keyboards, because they have little parts that go up and down, yeah. and you're in charge of disk drives, and you're in charge of printers. So I was in charge of all the peripherals and all the electromechanical devices that had anything to do with Elisa, and of course, Lisa was the computer that really never went anywhere, yeah. but Lisa was the woman who gave birth to Mac. Mm -hmm. You know, I often say Lisa, Lisa died in childbirth giving birth to Macintosh. Um, so that's what I was working on. Are the impressions and the general general feelings that Steve Jobs gets that accurate? I mean, what's, what was your experience working with him? And was it yeah, I mean, I, um, Steve. I mean, Steve was very complex and very intense, but it was, but it was not hard to perceive. Yeah, you know, Steve was not particularly mysterious. Um, and very blunt, you know, very direct. Well, well, he was very committed. Yeah, and and and, and, um, and he, you know, he respected you enough to simply tell you what he meant. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I mean, it could be rude, it could be difficult, and and I experienced Steve mostly as delightful. Um, we got along really well. Um, I mean, we didn't hang out at each other's houses all the time. Don't get me wrong, we, but I spent a fair bit of time with Steve, and 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 I was working on things he cared about a lot. I mean, so I was in the crosshairs of his interest. 
a, a bunch. Yeah. Um, and so it mattered. And, uh, and so both the, uh, the difficulty and kind of the awful draconian intensity of Steve I was aware of encountered directly a little bit, but most of the people that got like run over by Steve, um, I felt sort of asked for it. I mean, you didn't really have to make it that hard. Yeah. Um, and, but if you, if you knew what he was about and you knew what he was interested in and you wanted his help or you wanted his input, it was really easy to get. I mean, so I, I was able to, to get collaboration with Steve quite easily. And found it really useful. I and mean, he was—he was brilliant. Yeah. Um, and he, look, he's running the company. You know, I mean, if you want to understand what the product strategy is, it's spelled J O B S. I mean, just get over it. I mean, yeah. so if the people had a hard time, were the people who were trying to get Steve not to be Steve. That's stupid. Yeah. So if you're willing for Steve to be Steve, you're fine. You worked with laser printing, right? Yep. As well as Apple. So what? Yes. What did that entail? Oh, that was, that, that was probably technically the most interesting interesting thing I did for about five or ten years. Really, um, laser printing barely existed at the time. It was mm -hmm. 1970. I arrived at Apple six weeks before the company went public. The company grew from 800 to 5,000 people the first year I was there. You know, so I mean, it was an overwhelming period. Yeah. In six weeks, I was one of the old guys. Yeah. Um, and so the laser thing didn't really even exist yet. Apple had no printers at the time. Yeah. Um, and we realized, look, if people are going to do stuff, particularly in the office, in the professional world, you know, and so we started the POS, the, prof the, the personal office systems division was the one that created Lisa, then uh, it spawned the Macintosh division. You know, then professional people need to print stuff. Yeah. Um, and so we got to figure that out. And so the whole idea of you could actually do a font, you know, not just have everything be Courier 12, you know, in fixed font. You know, so the whole idea of laying out a document yeah. and then printing whatever you wanted it to be was a radical, I mean, people would look at what, what do you mean? You, you mean offset printing? You mean typesetting? We, we can't typeset on a personal computer. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, you can. Um, and so coming up with generating all these fonts and generating all these graphics and then having devices that could print it was a huge deal. Um, and desktop laser printing was an oxymoron. There were, you know, $150,000 the size of a car, 300 page per minute corporate printers in the basement yeah. you could buy from Xerox. But a merely twenty thousand dollar, you know, now six hundred yeah. dollar, uh, you know, desktop thing that would print ten pages a minute that we could use right here in this office. Yeah. You know, those didn't exist yet. So I saw the very, very first rack of optics, laser optics from Canon, which was incorporated inside a Hewlett Packard printer that was one of the very first desktop printers built in the world, okay. um, uh, in a lab in Boise, Idaho, in 1979. So we, we were right at the forefront of desktop laser printing even existing. So working on that, defining that, collaborating with printer manufacturers and making that stuff actually work was fascinating. So then you were around when Apple filed for their IPO, correct? Yes. What was that like? It was insane. Yeah. I mean, it had been filed. It was a, so literally my first day on the job was six weeks before the IPO was released to the public. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I mean, the paperwork had been filed and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, I mean, uh, it, the price earnings ratio was so high. I mean, nothing by Silicon Valley standards, but at the time, it was the first IPO of its kind in the history of capitalism. Yeah. You couldn't buy the stock in the state of Massachusetts because in Massachusetts, it was illegal. They have a price earnings ratio as high as ours. Wow. Yeah. And it was, we were too speculative to be allowed to be bought. Yeah. You know, the state had decided it's too dangerous to let the public buy this stuff. Yeah. Um, so it was completely crazy. Yeah. And it what turned overnight, I think, more millionaires than any other yeah. any other IPO in history. And of course they just hit I mean, what do you what do you how do you reflect back knowing that they just passed the one trillion dollar um, market value, market cap value. You know, it's reasonably insane. I mean, the, the, when you think it's it's such a demonstration that economics is really just quantified psychology. Um, what is something worth? Mm -hmm. It's worth what people are willing to pay for. And so, what people are willing to pay for in Apple now is the is the brand. Well, what yeah. does the brand mean? What actually happened was, and this is where you really have to give Steve Chops. Um, I mean, there are a bunch of very successful entrepreneurs who have done wonderful big things. Um, and then there are you know, that elite class of entrepreneurs that have done like world changing, world impacting things. Yeah. And then there's an incredibly short list of people who have done it more than once. And like maybe two or three people who've done it like a handful of times. 
So the senior jobs are on a really short list. Yeah. You know, along with you know, Thomas Edison and some other who have done it like over and over and over again. So do the Apple II, then do the Macintosh, you know, and then do Next, and then do Pixar, and then do, you know, um, and a couple of massively failed things like the Apple III and, and Next didn't really go anywhere, but it developed technology that turned into what was really required to make Pixar work and what have you. And then, and then come back into the iPod and then do the iPhone. So, um, and then eventually the iPad. These are world changing things. And he did it so successfully, and the company, and he did it successfully in a variety of, a couple of core attributes. It's been written about a ton and what have you. I don't need to just tell all that story. But what Apple has actually now become is so trusted, now I think blindly trusted, but so trusted that like, well, apparently Apple is the place where the next thing that we're all going to do with technology to change our behavior by being technology enabled, they will tell us what that is. And the coolest version of that, they will provide. In fact, you can just depend on them. So when they say, here, try this, we all do. But so now this actually got to a place rather than the product earns the brand, the brand now also is beginning to turn around and earn the product. Yeah. It, it actually imbues the product with value before it's in there. So it's, it's become a self-referencing cycle. Now we'll see in, in the post jobs era whether or not how long Apple can keep that going because the products will have to keep delivering. Mm -hmm. And there's some question about whether or not that's really the case. And right, so I guess the, the last question I saw that you did not have an iPhone. True. Is that, is that going away from your roots a little bit? What do you? Just... You know, I'm not an ideologue. Yeah. When I when I when I got that phone call from Apple that I hung up on four times. Right? Yeah. Way back when. Um, I had already been in, in, in to, and to make a living, I'd worked in you know heavy industry, doing mechanical engineering kinds of things for a couple of years. Um, and, and so I'd already realized there are other industries. So I have not spent my entire life, almost my entire life now, um, in Silicon Valley. So I was never um, dazzled. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, look, it's a computer. Like, yeah. okay, it's a thing. Right? You, there's a car that's a thing. You there's a toilet the... that's a thing. They're things. Okay, there's, yeah. we, we make stuff, you know, goods and services. That's what yeah. capitalism does. Either you provide services and experience or a thing. There's a thing or a serve. You know, it's, it's a behavior or it's a box. Um, and these are cool boxes. They do cool things. We should sell them to people if they're helpful to their lives, if they're efficacious. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a thing. Don't, don't get all wet-eyed about it, you know. Um, so I had a pretty practical relationship with technology. I always have. I don't love it per se. I love what it can do. Yeah. So, so why do I use an Android phone yeah. versus an iPhone? Well, um, first of all, um, I never agreed with the closed operating system okay. philosophy. Yeah. What the iPhone has going for it is certainly, by, by virtue of its brand strength, the popularity of the app world. So for a while... You know, the app availability world and the iPhone world was far superior. Yeah. Um, and that's largely been disappeared. Um, and one of the reasons I stand the Android is just to kind of keep practicing that I don't really care. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not nationalistic. Yeah. I, I absolutely use a MacBook. I must prefer yeah. a MacBook to an iPhone. But I ran ThinkPads for years. When I was doing consulting, the overwhelming majority of my clients ran on the IBM operating system. So fine. When in Rome do as the Romans do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm multilingual. You know, I'll be, I'll be on whatever works. Okay. So have you had an iPhone before? No, I never had an iPhone. Never had an iPhone. No, my wife, okay. I, I, my entire family has iPhones. Okay. Except my son, David the Fifth, who is now actually working for Essentials. He's actually the chief designer for Andy Rappaport. So he actually, you know, he, he's working for the Android guy. Yeah. You know, and he's the head designer for the Essentials. So if you, I mean, you reviewed Essential the Essentials phone. phone. Yeah. Yeah. So my son designed it. Okay. So the, the Mac is your go-to Apple product, is that? It is. Okay. Which What generation do you have? I'm actually back on the 2013 Retina because right. I like ports. Yep. I'm a big port fan, and a little, uh, dongles are not my thing. I just got... So the, I've got an HDMI, I've got a couple of USBs, you, know, you know, real ports, please. Yeah, I just got the 2018 one because I've been waiting for years to buy a new one, and yeah. I bought the highest tier. I have that... And it's all USB-C, right? Yeah. I have that strictly for performance, for sure, just sure. the 4K video edits, but it is another life having to carry around a dongle just for an SD right. card. Yeah, give me a break. All right, so this is the man who hung up on Apple four times, <laughs> something not many people can say. But it worked out. Who is in talking with me today at Boston College uh, for the iDownloadBlog YouTube channel. Um, I will be having a quick video as well on my personal channel talking a little bit about hybrid vehicles, maybe a little bit about Tesla. I'll leave that linked in the description if you have any interest in checking that out. Uh, but Mr. Dave Evans, thank you for talking with me today and sharing some of the insights into um, some of your past life with Apple. 
Thanks so much. Good to be here.